The more I read James Joyce's Araby, the more beautiful and complex and profound it is. This is one of those stories that can too easily be glossed over, especially if you treat it as one that is more plot-driven than character-driven, and so I highly encourage you to read it more than once, even twice or three times. A mistake that you can make while reading this story is getting too hung up on the end. Many readers leave this story primarily asking why, after the boy spent all this time thinking about Araby and waited on his uncle to give him money and rushed down to the bazaar right before it closed, does he ultimately decide not to buy anything? And they think, okay, so what was the point? If you stay with me, I'm going to offer an explanation and an analysis of Araby and help you see the profound complexities of this young boy whose experience is one that we all ultimately come to know. Hi guys, I am Dr. Whitney Costers, professor of English, offering free lectures on classic texts here on YouTube to help you understand them or at least give you a different way of perceiving them. Please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so that you don't miss out on future videos which are put out weekly. Now, Araby is part of a collection of stories called Dubliners that Joyce published in 1914 that portray the ordinary and realistic lives of the people in Dublin. And it's probably one of the easiest ways to ease into Joyce, an author who is known for being quite challenging to read. Even today with a PhD in English and having taught literature for over 20 years, Finnegan's Wake still really intimidates me. But Araby is quite easy to understand, maybe a little too easy, and maybe that's why so much of its imagery, symbolism, metaphors, and the character's epiphany at the end may too easily be overlooked. Araby is a coming-of-age story, or rather, a story in which our young narrator is suddenly disillusioned in that he comes to face reality as it is. Now, Dubliners as a whole presents a stark, realistic look into the harsh lives of the Irish people, and Araby is no exception. In fact, Joyce proclaimed that his intention in writing Dubliners was to write a chapter of the moral history of my country, and I chose Dublin for the scene because the city seemed to me the center of paralysis. That word paralysis, the act of being stuck, being unable to move or make real choices, is crucial, and we're going to see it illustrated in Araby, which is extremely significant since this is a story about a boy who is literally transitioning or moving from one stage of life to another. We're going to watch him earnestly try to move outside of the center of paralysis through two things, his adoration for Mangan's sister and by attending the bazaar or marketplace known as Araby. So let's begin by examining the environment that the narrator seeks to escape. The descriptions of the setting are incredibly bleak, as you've probably noticed. In the very first paragraph, we learn that North Richmond is a blind street, which means a dead end, and that should be read both literally and metaphorically, especially in the context of paralysis. The houses on the street are personified as being conscious of decent lives within them, and they gaze at one another with brown, imperturbable faces. A priest had died in the boy's house, and the air is musty from having been long enclosed, and the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old, useless papers. The houses are later described as somber, while the lamps of the street lift their feeble lanterns. The boys play in the dark, muddy lanes behind the houses where they run the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages to the back doors of the dark, dripping gardens where odors arose from the ash pits. And behind the boy's house is a wild garden containing a central apple tree, symbolic of Eden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which once tasted brings shame, knowledge, the loss of innocence, and the downfall of humankind. And this entire story is a metaphorical depiction of the boy taking a bite of that apple. Keep in mind that it is his knowledge and shame, this epiphany that he has by the end of the story, that makes him gaze up into the darkness to see himself as a creature driven and derided by vanity. So, how does he get to this point? The narrator tells us how he and the other boys played in the street till their bodies glowed, and that their shouts echoed in the silent street, and they hid in the shadows unknown and unseen when adults walk past, and when his friend Mangan's sister calls Mangan in for tea. There are many things that we can discern from this story without it being explicitly stated. For one thing, we are never told the age of the boy, but it seems he's on the cusp of adolescence, indicated by the fact that he still plays outside with his friends, but suddenly becomes increasingly infatuated with Mangan's sister. 
And if you pay attention to the way that he interacts with his friends throughout the story, you'll notice that he's quiet and extremely observant and introspective, and he retreats more and more into the shadows and isolation as his infatuation with Mangan's sister grows. And within this isolation, the boy succumbs to a romanticized life, a medieval quest, a disillusioned love. Remember, he is telling the story not as it's happening, but as it happened. He tells us that every morning I lay on the floor in the front parlor watching her door. The blind was pulled down to within an inch of the sash so that I could not be seen. When she came out on the doorstep, my heart leaped. I ran to the hall, seized my books, and followed her. I kept her brown figure always in my eye, and when we came near the point at which our ways diverged, I quickened my pace and passed her. This happened morning after morning. I had never spoken to her except for a few casual words, and yet her name was like a summons to all my foolish blood. As his adoration for Mangan's sister grows, the narrator punctuates the dull, hard moments of daily life with idolatry, fantasies, and this medieval chivalry that he sees himself having. Or maybe it's the other way around. His beautiful fantasies are often interrupted by people like Miss Mercer and his tipsy late uncle and the banal conversations at Araby. Either way, the boy lives in a self-created fantasy, bearing his chalice safely through a throng of foes as he's jostled by drunken men and exposed to the curses of laborers. You probably noticed the heaviness with which religion imbues itself into and hangs over the story, and yet there are no official religious services that actually take place in the story, only mockeries of them. The boy attends a Christian brother's school, the former tenant of his home was a priest who has left some of his belongings behind, and the boy's aunt suggests that he not attend Araby since it is the night of our Lord, and there are many, many more examples in the story. But the boy does not pray to God. Instead, he confuses, if not conflates, his love for Mangan's sister with religious devotion, if not some sort of deification and possible masturbation. Remember, he lays prostrate on the floor before her image, as if in worship, and he tells us, One evening I went into the back drawing room in which the priest had died. It was a dark, rainy evening, and there was no sound in the house. I was thankful that I could see so little. All my senses seemed to desire to veil themselves, and feeling that I was about to slip from them, I pressed the palms of my hands together until they trembled, murmuring, O oh love, O oh love, many times. He also says that her name sprang to my lips at moments in strange prayers and praises, which I myself did not understand. Now, this moment of self-reflection, this ability to admit that he is confused by this new feeling is significant. Even as he worships her, he mentions that it was a dark, rainy evening, and he was so thankful that he could see so little and that all of his senses veiled themselves. The boy is literally and figuratively cloaked in the darkness, in his illusions of what he believes Megan's sister to be and what he thinks his feeling of love and adoration are. He is blinded, just as the blind environment in which he lives. He is as naive and innocent as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but this is the trouble and uncertainty of transitioning from the stages of childhood marked by naivete, innocence, and purity to more complex experiences. And I think it's because this experience is so new, so unique to him, that he takes it to such an extreme. Now, you probably noticed that we don't know much about Mangan's sister, but there is a good reason for that. We don't know much about her because the narrator doesn't know much about her, and that is a deliberate choice on Joyce's part. This girl is only known by her relation to Mangan. She does not even have a name, nor is she in any way a very defined character. Listen to how she's described and thus understood by the narrator. She was waiting for us, her figure defined by the light from the half-open door. Her brother always teased her before he obeyed, and I stood by the railings looking at her. Her dress swung as she moved her body, and the soft rope of her hair tossed from side to side. And she's often referred to as a brown figure who he watches, waits for, dreams of, prays to. It is not Mangan's sister with whom he is in love, so she cannot be a defined person with a name. She is deliberately made to be a representation, an emblem, a female prototype upon which the boy can project his ideal vision, sexual needs, and romantic agenda. She is a shadowy figure specifically because she can be modified, altered, and changed according to the needs and desires of the male figure. She is an object to be sought after and to be had, to engender his fantasies and to give him a quest to complete. 
She is often described in the light or in the color white as though she were angelic. She is worshipped almost like a Mary and Madonna figure simultaneously. That he knows very little about her, I mean, after all, for the most part, all he does is watch her, worship her, follow her, and pass her by, says far more about him than her. And I'm sure that all of us can relate to this experience. Did you ever have a crush on someone who you thought about day in and day out and who eventually got lost in and transformed by your own fantasies, desires, and hopes? It's a very common occurrence, actually. It happens because it's a desire that we need fulfilled, not because that's who they actually are. So how does the boy use Mangan's sister as an emblem to move beyond the reality that is Dublin? His desire to remove himself from the mundane day-to-day -day life comes to a head when he finally speaks to her. She asks him if he would be going to Araby, which is a marketplace, and she tells him that she would love to go, but she can't because she's going to be at a retreat that week in her convent. In a state of confusion, the boy looks for a way to ensure a future interaction with her by promising her to bring something for her from the bazaar. And just like that, like a knight sent to find the Holy Grail, the boy has a quest which he believes will secure, if not complete, his love that he thinks exists between them. Now, there are a couple of things we need to discuss. First, as I mentioned earlier, it's not Mangan's sister that the boy loves. It is the image that he has projected onto her that he adores, though he is not yet cognizant of this. But this is exactly why she can tell him that she has a retreat at her convent and it is of no matter to him. She literally just told him that she is permanently unavailable. She is going to give her life over to God and live in chastity. The other thing is the significance of Araby to the boy's life full of fantasy and illusion. Araby was actually a real bazaar that came to Dublin in 1894 and was promoted, as you can see here, as a grand oriental fete. This was a huge marketplace, not just where you could buy commodities, but also a festival that featured real entertainments like eight military bands, a magnificent display of fireworks, the great Stockholm Wonder, international tug of war, Cairo donkey and donkey boys, and skirt dancing up to date. And in his imagination, the boy becomes fully immersed in this bazaar. He exoticizes it and romanticizes it. He says, the syllables of the word Araby were called to me through the silence in which my soul luxuriated and cast an Eastern enchantment over me. Suddenly, this idolatry, love, infatuation for Mangan's sister, whatever you want to call it, is driven further by his illusions of the East and what he believes Araby to be. And as hard as he tries to maintain his fantasy, as I said earlier, reality interferes. He says, I wish to annihilate the tedious intervening days. I shaped against the work of school. At night in my bedroom and by day in the classroom, her image came between me and the page I strove to read. He anxiously looks forward to the day he is to go to Araby, and he begins the evening under the guise of romantic disillusionment. He says, the high, cold, empty, gloomy rooms liberated me, and I went from room to room singing. From the front window, I saw my companions playing below in the street. Their cries reached me weakened and indistinct, and leaning my forehead against the cool glass, I looked over at the dark house where she lived. I may have stood there for an hour seeing nothing but the brown-clad figure cast by my imagination. Notice that unlike his friends who are playing in the street, he is sitting alone in his room thinking of Mangan's sister. His uncle's forgetfulness and drunkenness interfere with this great quest he has set out on and is on this night that he becomes aware of his foolishness, illusions, and fantasy. It's nine o'clock before he is able to leave for Araby, and the journey is hindered and impacted by the facts of his reality. His uncle's inability to remember the boy's desire to go to the bazaar means he arrives extremely late. It's near closing time, and so his arrival is marked by anxiety that he's going to miss it. He says... I could not find any sixpenny entrance, and fearing that the bazaar would be closed, I passed in quickly through a turnstile, handing a shilling to a weary-looking man. Expecting the excitement and the bustle of an exotic eastern land, he remarks that nearly all the stalls were closed and the greater part of the hall was in darkness. I recognized a silence like that which pervades a church after a service. His illusions become dimmer and dimmer as he walks through the aisles of the bazaar. In fact, he says he has difficulty remembering why he even came. His full disillusionment occurs when he stops at a stall where porcelain vases and flowered tea sets are sold. Instead of exotic and enchanting people and objects from the Far East, he's confronted with three English people. 
This is no accident that the sellers are English. It is Joyce's reminder of the conflict that has existed between the English and Irish and the inferior position in which the Irish were often placed in the English consciousness. And here the boy is made to feel this as he's excluded and practically ignored by the woman who clearly does not want to serve him. This is no knight's quest. This beautiful, fantastic, exotic bazaar that was supposed to be full of spectacle, lavishness, and the energy of a distant world is nothing but a dark and lonely moment populated by Westerners and their banal conversations. And it is at this moment that the boy comes of age or sees reality for what it is. He is stuck in its paralysis, unable to get out despite his illusions of love for a girl he doesn't even know and who doesn't know him. He says, I heard a voice call from one end of the gallery that the light was out. The upper part of the hall was now completely dark. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. Now, it's interesting that at the very moment that the bazaar closes and the lights are turned off, when he's back in the darkness, that he has this epiphany, this moment of truth, reality, and revelation that he can never unsee, never unknow. It is at this moment that he recognizes himself for what he now is, a creature, a word that implies that he is one of millions sorting his way through the world, almost animalistic, perhaps too lowly ever to attain that profound ideal love that he is seeking at such a young age in which he does not fully understand. He is a confused and misguided adolescent who had draped himself in dreams, mistaken love, and newfound sexual needs. A young man who conflated obsession, idolatry, and adoration with Catholicism, exoticism, and pure love, and who, like Adam and Eve, has forever lost his innocence, his naivete, and the delusions that protect us throughout childhood. Shut out from the Garden of Eden and embarrassed and ashamed, the boy turns away slowly and walks down the middle of the bazaar, returning to the reality that he never left in the first place, the reality in which he remains paralyzed in. Instead of leaving the bazaar victorious and certain of his reward when he returns, like the medieval knight he fancied himself, the narrator leaves angry, disenchanted, and like a fool. This love was never to be. But it's not that this love was never to be, it never was in the first place. Now this is quite a shocking and bleak moment, but in reality it's one that we all endure and sometimes it shakes us to the core. And the way Joyce presents it is so truthful and raw and subtle. This loss of innocence doesn't come from some dramatic exchange or incident. Indeed, there isn't just one specific thing that happens that we can identify as the source of this transition. It happens introspectively and quite quietly. And that is what makes this story, to me anyway, so beautiful and thought-provoking. What do you do in that moment? How do you handle it? Or really, how did you handle it when it happened to you? I would love to hear your thoughts on this story and the moment that you transitioned into the world of reality or adulthood or whatever you want to call it. This story really resonates with me, so please share with me some of your thoughts on this lecture, this interpretation, or any other thoughts that you have about the story down below. Please check out some of my other lectures. I have an entire playlist on the short story. Be sure to subscribe and join me for the next one. I will see you guys there.